and we want to let you know that this is a church where you can belong before you believe. But above all, we want you to know that no matter where you've been, no matter where you are, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And there's a place for you here. So get ready. Your experience starts now. Good morning. Welcome to Open Door Church. So glad to see some of you in the house today. Those of you joining online, we just welcome you. Uh, we are glad that we can all be part of this celebration. Um, if you'd like to, go ahead and start a watch party and share it. Maybe not pastor, though. Okay. <laughs> Um, but go ahead and share this. That way, those who may not know that we're on or live or anything can go ahead and connect and uh, be part of worship and everything. I was listening to a new song this day by uh, Dante Brown called Joyful, and it says, This is the day the Lord has made. I ain't going to let it slip away. And I just thought that was so great. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are going to enjoy every single moment of it. And I'm so glad that today is a day that we get to join in the house and celebrate the name of Jesus and our community and our family. If you happen to be a first-time visitor here or online, I just encourage you to text CONNECT to 757-320-5615. I'm actually memorizing that number, 757-320-5615. It's only taken two years. <laughs> Yay! So you can text that number, um, and we will just stay in touch with you and connect with you and get to know you, and you can get to know us a little bit better. And if things change, and um, hopefully maybe some restrictions will lift sometime, and we can get that information out to you. Uh, so it's just a great way for everybody to stay connected. I really am always encouraged to get the updates. I'm reminded to set my clock ahead. I'm reminded that we have church. So I really like having that connect um, with the church. And we get to worship the Lord through our giving and being generous and freely giving God. You know, it says, this is the day the Lord has made. So part of that, not letting it slip away, is giving freely and being generous with your tithes and your offering. Um, there's just so many ways that we can contribute to this church. And one of them is to text GIVE to 757-320-5555. You can go online to ODC Suffolk and GIVE. You can mail it. You can drop it by the office. You can do your online bank pay. And you can also drop your cash or check into the bucket on the back table. Um, those are just some great ways that uh, we can contribute. Our food pantry distribution is next Saturday. So we are continuing to collect not only money, but food. And remember, when you're giving food, Make it something you want to eat, too. We want to give the very best to everyone, not just what we might have in the back of our cupboards. But we want to think about people who actually are in need and need our gift of generosity. So we can do that by giving them something that we would actually want. Baby bottles. If you have not turned in your baby bottles, we just please bring them in. Put them on the back table back there, and we will get them where they need to go. Nurseries are open again. We're just so glad for everybody's hard work in making that happen so that more people can come and enjoy um, being in the house. So if you have infants, they can be released first, and then we'll just stagger, just look around and see how many toddlers are going. That way we cannot have a holdup on the line. So we're going to make a joyful noise. We're going to celebrate being together as a family, and we're going to lift up the glorious name of Jesus. So we changed our clocks today. We see a few, I mean, well, last night. Or the cell towers did it for us. And uh, we're a little thin this morning, so maybe people are still sleeping in, getting used to that hour. <clears throat> but uh, spring technically begins next week. How many of you are excited about that? Yay! Yep. So uh, my tablet's being silly. But um, we're going to sing a song. It's a kind of a happy spring feeling song here called This Is What You Do.
always like springtime with you, making all things new. Your light is breaking through the dark. Love is sweeter than wine, bringing joy, bringing light. Your hope is rising like the dawn. This is what you do. gracious and thankful God that we know you that we can call you savior friend father comforter 
so many things, Lord, that you are faithful to be here for us, Lord. And God, we want to give you praise and worship and adoration. And we know that one day in heaven, God, that's what we're going to be doing 24-7. Like it mentions in the book of Revelation that they're there to sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, Lord, you are holy. You are righteous and you are good. And God, that brings new life. That brings excitement in us, Lord. And when we meet you as our Savior, and we know you as our Savior, that puts something new inside of us, Lord. And you make us come alive. And we're so grateful for that, Lord. We love your presence. We love you. We love how you are, Lord. In Zephaniah, it says that you sing over us, Lord. You sing over us. And God, I thank you that there's an exchange in worship, that when we worship you, you're receiving, but you're also blessing us, Lord. There's a dance between us and with you, Lord. And we love you and we want more of your presence more of you because it's never enough, Lord. Let us never be satisfied. Let us never go through the motions. Let us always desire more of you, Lord. We love you so much. So, so much, Lord God. And we look forward to what heaven will be like one day as we worship you and we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Worship you, Jesus. Worship you, Lord, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, Lord. Thank you for being in our presence, Lord, for being here. Open our eyes, God, that we see that you're here in this room, Lord. Isn't it just like heaven when you walk into the room? There's not a thing that's hidden when every eye is on you. Can't get enough of your presence. It's the perfect point of view. Isn't it just like, just like, just like heaven? Oh, come a little closer, stay a little longer. Oh, I can't get enough of you. Oh, come a little closer, stay a little longer. Oh, I can't get enough of you. Doesn't it sound like heaven when you see
that's what we'll be singing. Holy, you are holy. Holy, you are holy. Holy, you are holy.
ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Come on and sing it out, nice and loud. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Come on and lift your voices nice and loud. Your praise will Thank you, Jesus. ever be on my lips, oh, ever be on my lips. Your praise hallelujah. will ever be on my oh, lips, ever yeah. be on my lips. Your praise will hallelujah. ever be on my lips, hallelujah. ever be on hallelujah. my lips. Your praise oh, will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, just let that be our prayer that your praise will ever be on our lips, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for gathering us together. We thank you for such a sweet spirit of worship here today. Lord God, for your house is a house of worship. It's a house of prayer, Lord. It's a house of your presence. And Lord, we yearn and we desire and hunger for your presence more than anything else, Lord. So, Lord God, we just pray that your presence, Lord, would just saturate the room right now. Lord, just come and rest upon each and every one of us, God, in, a, in just a special way, Lord. Just let your presence come, Lord. Fall like the dew upon us, Lord. Fall like soft rain upon us, Lord, God, and help us to be able to receive your words today, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Logistics. All right, just quickly um, give a few baptismal certificates out here. Bree, Bree, where's Bree at? Bree, come get your certificate. She was baptized in 60 degree water. <laughs> <clears throat> to her surprise, congratulations. It's 80 degrees today, just so y'all can cry. Christopher Jones, is he here today, or his mom? Yeah. Okay. Is Allison Cornish here? She's not here? Okay. All right. Okay. So now, the woman of the hour. Give her a hand, please. Amen. Good morning. How is everyone? Good? <laughs> okay. That is awesome. Wasn't that beautiful, the last song that angels and saints will sing glory to the Lord? Isn't that 
an awesome picture of all of us in heaven gathered around the throne of God with angels and all the saints that have ever gone before us gathered together and worshiping Jesus our Lord. What a powerful, awesome picture that is, isn't it? Okay, so this morning we're in Lent and we're with uh, the Easter season and looking that way. So I want to talk this morning about the lamb, the cross, and the blood. And so, oh right, the nurseries can be dismissed. I think they forgot to dismiss nurseries. They can go out. But the lamb, the cross, and the blood. And I want to start our passage um, in... Uh, Ro- um, sorry, Exodus chapter 12, if you'll turn there on your phone or your Bible, Exodus 12, we're going to just stay in here just a little bit, because I want to talk to you this morning about the Passover. Pastor Tony mentioned it a little bit last week, and um, I just want to compare it to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus as the Lamb of God and our Passover Lamb. And so I want to just make the correlation between the first Passover when God's people were in Egypt and in bondage and in slavery and how God delivered them out with a powerful hand in just a moment, in just a day, they were delivered out and uh, got on their way in liberty and freedom, set free from bondage, going into the promised land and the purpose and destiny of God for their lives. And uh, compare that to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and that Christian salvation of leaving the world and being set free from the bondage of Satan and entering into the new plan and purpose and will of God for their life. Okay, so in uh, the very first scripture I do want to look at before we look in Exodus is John uh, verse 1 and 29. When Jesus was starting his ministry, John the Baptist was baptizing people, hence the name John the Baptist, Baptist, uh, uh, baptizing people by the Jordan River, and he saw Jesus coming. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So he identified Jesus as the Lamb of God. Now, that would be pretty strange if a person was walking down the street, and you're like, behold, the cheetah of God, or behold, the ostrich of the Lord. You know, but he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the picture that came into their mind and every good Jew in Jesus' day immediately related a lamb to a sacrifice and a lamb to worship and a lamb as something that they had been familiar with in all of their history as a part of their lives and worship and sacrifice. So when they said, behold, the lamb of God, then they're looking, Jesus is the lamb, and they immediately begin to make a connection to Jesus and sacrifice and blood and sin and all the things they connected to uh, a lamb. And so uh, so when we see this, in a dramatic way, you know, God was coming to his people in Exodus 12, and he's saying, in a dramatic way, I'm going to deliver you. In a dramatic way, I'm going to set you free. In a dramatic way, you're going to be released and loosed from the power of sin over your life and the power of bondage and the power of Pharaoh. And so for us, Egypt is the world. Pharaoh is Satan, the devil. Our bondage is sin, our bondage is weaknesses, and so God wants to set us free from Satan, sin, and bondage. He has set many of us free from those things, but if not, then today is the day of salvation for you. Today is a day of freedom for you. If you are here and you have never accepted Jesus to be the Lamb of God in your life, So in Exodus 12, and we're going to read a lot of scriptures one at a time or a few at a time. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will be a new beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So he said, all right, I'm changing the calendar. Forget it. I don't care if it's the fifth month or the sixth month. Today is New Year's Day for you. This is a new day. This is a new month. This is a new calendar. I'm even changing time for you because from now on, you're going to mark this day as the first month and a new day for you as a, the people of God. Now, isn't it interesting that we mark time by the birth and death of Jesus, that it's uh, 2021 A.D.? 
and we relate time from the time Jesus came on the earth. The calendar year changed. The calendar year started at the birth of Christ from B.C. to A.D. And so he said, um, this will be a new beginning. So truly a new beginning is what God wanted to give them. Truly a new beginning is what God wants to give us. Your history starts here and now. Our history starts at the cross of Jesus Christ. Our new history, our new way of living, our new life starts at the cross of Jesus. There started at the Exodus. Okay, and so he said in verse 3, tell all the congregation of Israel on the 10th day, take a, a lamb and take it to your father's house, a lamb for a household. This was every single home had to take their own personal lamb. Every household took a lamb on the 10th day and they kept it to the fourth day. And this speaks of it being an individual decision decision and every household participated in the exodus and participated in their liberty and their freedom it was not just all of us together I'll do a lamb for all of us no you go out you get your lamb a personal lamb a personal decision to obey God and take a lamb and bring it into your house and he became a part of their family and so on day 10 and day 11 day 12 you know uh, he became a part of their family for for four days, this lamb became a part. Jesus Christ came to earth and became a part of the human family as the lamb of God. He lived with us. He ate with us. He breathed with us. I'm sure the kids played with that little lamb while it was in the house with them. He might have slept in the bed with some of the kids, but he became a part of them, and he lived with them, and they became to know him and, and uh, love this little lamb in that time that he was there. But after after those four days, then they had to kill the lamb, and they had to take the lamb of this little, the blood of this little lamb, and they had to take a little branch of hyssop and dip it in the blood and put it on their doorposts. And God said, put it on the side and over your doorpost because this night I'm going to show myself strong. This night I'm going to show myself powerful. This night I'm going to do something that nobody has ever seen before. I'm God, I'm mighty, and I'm going to bring you out with a high lifted hand and you're going to come out and you're going to be delivered. And so everybody that believed God took the lamb and killed it. And they roasted the lamb in the fire. And they took the blood and they put it on their door for their household individually, personally, put the blood over their life. That that night when God sent the angel of death to come in, because he had told Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn let my firstborn go. And Pharaoh said no. And so the enemy doesn't want to let you go. Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. He got a lot of good work out of them, building his cities and building his sphinxes and building his palaces. He got a lot of good work out of them. And the devil gets a lot of good work out of people, doesn't he? He gets a lot of good work and his work done by people. And he doesn't want to let anybody go. And so the Lord said, let my firstborn Egypt go. And Pharaoh wouldn't do it. Not one time, not two, not three, not up to nine times. God gave him an opportunity. And sometimes when the pressure was on, he said, okay. As soon as the pressure was off, he held them back tight again. The enemy doesn't want to let you go. The enemy didn't want to let them go. In Jesus' name. And so he, he held on to them. But God said, tonight, tonight's going to be different. Tonight he's going to change his mind. Tonight he's going to let my people go. And so I was thinking of uh, my grandkids. I'm always thinking of my grandkids. And they watched the little, <laughs> they watched the little cartoon Prince of Egypt a few months ago. And Jason and Danielle said, I, we didn't realize, you know, how intense it was. And they were watching it. And, you know, the children of Israel had their chains on and their building and the huge blocks and stone that they had to build, the pyramids and the sphinxes and all that. And uh, uh, Juniper, which, you know, she's two, and she looked at Jason and she said, doing like what are they doing doing and he said build build they're building 
And so the soundtrack was in the movie. So a few day, days later, uh, the uh, soundtrack, they were playing it in the house. And Juniper stopped and listened, and she said, build, build. <laughs> She's like, oh, build. They had, like, hard work, and they were building. And then about a week later, Cal accepted the Lord as his Savior because he saw the death angel come through it like a dark smoke. It represented it. And the firstborn of every single family, if you're firstborn in your family, raise your hand. Okay, all of you would be dead. <laughs> if you were an Egyptian, all of you would have been dead. You were the firstborn of, of people and animals. All the firstborn little puppies, and little cows, they were dead. But if you took the blood, like God said, and you put it over your house, the angel of death was going to come and pass over your house. And you were going to be safe, and your firstborn was going to be safe. So when we apply the blood of Jesus to our life, death has no more dominion over us. Death has no more power over us. The second death will have no more power over us. We die a physical death. But we do not die a spiritual death uh, like those that do not have the blood of Jesus on their life. And so they uh, took this lamb and they ate it. And he said, roast that lamb in the fire. They were supposed to uh, roast it. Okay, let me just make sure I get it all here. Okay. Okay, and so the Lord, when he was telling them in verse 5, when you're picking out your lamb, he said, your lamb. And it's, again, a personal identity, your lamb lamb, that you make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Your lamb is supposed to be without blemish, a male, a year old. You might take it from the sheep or the goats without blemish. First Peter, it talks about the blood of Jesus without blemish, without spot as the lamb of God. Jesus was this Passover lamb without blemish, a male, in the prime of his life, in the prime, 33 years old, in the prime of his life, like a one-year-old little lamb. He said in verse 6, and you will keep it till the 14th day. Again, the whole assembly of the congregation will kill their lamb at twilight 7. Then they will take the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lintel and eat. When they eat the flesh that night, it is roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs will they eat it. Uh, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and with its inner Part. And so they roasted it in the fire. And this talks about, you know, the, the trial and the testing of Jesus' life being tested and roasted and going through the fire, that Jesus went through the fire as the Lamb of God, and that every single part of this lamb was roasted, its head, its legs. You know, normally when you kill an animal to eat it, you know, you cut out the insides, or you might cut off its head and drain the blood. But it said this entire thing was to be roasted in the fire, and this entire thing uh, was to be uh, uh, partaken of by them. And this just speaks of the 100% commitment that Jesus Christ had to the will of God and the purposes of God and to you and me. There was nothing that Jesus held back from us for our salvation. He gave it all. Jesus gave it all to you, the head, the legs, the inside, the outside. His commitment was complete. His commitment was 100% to you and me to purchase our freedom from bondage. He gave it all, every part of it, and they were supposed to eat all of it, and they were not supposed to leave any leftover to the next day because the food they were giving them was food for that day. It was a very important time in the history of them as a nation. It was a very critical, important time when God was getting ready to change everything about their world, everything about their life, what they used to know, what they were, what they were identified as, servants, slaves, in bondage, oppressed, was getting ready to change. This meal is for today. This meal is for now. And it reminds us in the New Testament that it says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. 
salvation. This is the day that you're supposed to accept Christ. We're not supposed to put it off. We're not supposed to wait. Now is the time. Now is the day. And so on that day when they were sent out, that nation of Israel was born as a nation. They had just been a loose people of God, but that they became a nation of people. And so when Jesus died on the cross, was buried and resurrected, and then 40 days roamed the earth and then uh, went to heaven and poured out his spirit, we became the people of God. On the day of Pentecost, the Christian nation was born. Christianity was birthed out of Judaism at that time. The correlation between the exodus, their exit out of the world, the exit out of Egypt, and us out of the exit of the world, out of the exit of sin, of slavery, of bondage. And so now we are free in Christ. We are free to serve him. That's what he said. Uh, uh, Moses said to Pharaoh, let them go that they may serve me and worship me. And so God has set us free by the power of the blood, the power of the lamb, the power of the cross, that we are free to serve him and to worship him. And so he wants us to worship him with sincerity and with truth. He wants us to serve him in the wilderness and into the promised land. And so that was the purpose of Christ and the power of the cross that set us free from the bondages that held on to us. But it said here that they had to, they ate it with unleavened bread. And so he said, listen, I want you to, eat it and they had to stand up while they were eating it and he said with your shoes on and with a belt around your waist and uh you're not going to eat leavened bread because you don't have time to let your bread rise you know leaven is yeast and, he, and they used to put it in the bread and it would make the yeast the bread rise and you know if you ever made bread you put the yeast in and then you wait a couple hours and you have to punch it down again and then it rises again and you might punch it down again it's a long process well God said there's not going to be time so I want you to purge out all the leaven and yeast out of your house. And they would take a little piece of that, that yeast, normally one handful, to start the next batch. Well, he's like, well, you're not starting another batch because that's old bread and that's old leaven. And you're not going to eat that anymore. You're going to eat the bread of sincerity and truth, the unleavened bread that does not have leaven or the old not a taste, not a smell, not a touch of the old, because this is a new day and this is a new hour, and you're a new people and you're called by a new name. And so nothing of the old, I don't want you to bring anything of that old into this new life that I am giving you. And so they purged out the leaven. And there are scriptures in the New Testament that says, purge out the old leaven of corruption that you may be a new lump. And it says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so we know that leaven also represented sin in the Bible, in the New Testament. Leaven was a type of sin, and you let a little bit in there, and it grows, and it expands, and it affects and influences everything around it, and it enlarges. And pretty soon, that leaven, that sin, takes over the whole lump. And so in the New Testament, it says, purge out that leaven of corruption that you might be a new lump. And so as we are in the season of Lent and we are remembering what Jesus did on the cross for us, it's a wonderful opportunity to say, all right, Lord, I'm purging out the leaven of my life. Lord, I am examining myself in my life to see if there's anything I'm allowing to permeate my life that's growing, that's out of control, that's taken over my life that I need to get rid of, that I need to repent of, that I need to purge out of my life, that I can be a new lump in Christ. So we are reflecting on this time and this season of what God did, and they purged that out, and they stood eating that lamb because they needed to be ready to go, and we need to be ready to go with God. We need to be ready 
when the Lord says it's time to go, go. We need to live in an expectation that God is going to do something. They believed him, so they put on their shoes. I think he made them eat that meal with their shoes on because if it was time to go, it would take way too long for them to have to go back in the house and find Johnny's shoe under the bed or in the closet or where's my shoes, Mom? I don't know. Let's just wear our shoes while we eat our meal because when it's time to go, we don't have time to go back and look for your shoes. It also reminds me of the second coming of Jesus, that we need to be ready because Christ can return at any time. And we need to be ready because there's not time. It says when you're out in the field, you don't have time to go back and get anything. When Christ returns, we will be ready. We live in an expectation of the second coming of Jesus Christ, that he could come at any time. And when he comes, he is going to deliver us in a mighty way. And that final enemy that's ruled from all of mankind, from Adam till he comes, have experienced and tasted death. But those that are alive, when he returns, will not experience physical death. Because it says we'll be caught up together with him in the air. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye will be changed. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And so we will not experience those that are alive. What a wonderful day to be living that they will never taste a physical death at Christ's return. That is a pretty awesome day, and we might be living in it, and we might not. We don't know, but we're going to live ready. We're going to live with our shoes on. We're going to live with our belt around our waist, aren't we? We're going to know that at any time he could come, the second coming of Jesus. And so they had to be prepared and uh, it had to be all of it, and none of it was supposed to. No leftovers. Honey, no leftovers. All of it burned. All of it eaten. All right. <laughs> but there's something else, and there's something very else, because they had to eat all of it. And I'm here to tell you today that sometimes the things that the Lord puts on our plate to eat, we don't always want to eat it. And so as a, as a Christian, we can't really be a picky eater. We can't really pick what I'm going to eat and what I'm not. We're not going to uh, be able to pick and choose that I'm just going to eat some of the Bible and the scriptures I like and the ones that, you know, uh, bless me and make me feel good. But sometimes it's uh, when it contradicts the way we're living, it's hard to swallow. When I read my Bible... And it contradicts my opinion, and it contradicts what I'm feeling that day. It's a hard pill to swallow. And one of the writers says it's, you know, when you eat the word, it's like sweet in your mouth, but it's bitter in your belly. Because the outworking of the word of God, you hear a great sermon, and it's incredible, but the outworking of that in your daily life, when you have to put you, you know, your shoes on and you have to walk through that great word that God gave you in the scripture that morning and then you have to put it to practice and make it real in your life, that's when it's hard to swallow. That's when it's hard, when it goes contrary to my human nature and my human feelings and my human knowledge and my natural carnal man does not want to eat what God puts on my plate sometimes. But he said, take this. And it reminded me of communion when Jesus at the Last Supper broke the bread and he said, take, eat all of it. Eat all of it, church. Eat all of it, not just the palatable parts that agree with our lifestyle, but the ones that challenge our lifestyle and, and contradict the way we're living and thinking. Then I have to line up with this, and I have to eat all of it. No leftovers on my plate. Jesus, if you put it on my plate, I'm going to eat it. You said it's good for me. <laughs> you said it's good for me, so I'm going to eat it. And so... They, uh, they did this, and they ate standing up with the truth. You know, the truth wrapped around our waist. We live in the truth. And so when I don't know if any of them standing there eating said, I feel like a fool. I'm standing here eating my food. I'm not even sitting in a chair. I feel so stupid. I've got my shoes on, and I'm eating this lamb. And, like, I, I, they might have thought, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. This is silly. But those that were eating in faith believing, he came. 
He came, Pharaoh, the, the death angel came, the people died, Pharaoh said, get out of here. All of you, get out of here. Take your animals. Take here. Take our gold. Take our silver. They All the Egyptians gave them anything they wanted, and they got out of there. And in, in a minute, in an instant, they were delivered from hardship and bondage. And the thing about it was also that the, the hyssop, the bitter herbs that they put over the doorposts and all that, that was that representing the bitter bondage that they had been in their life. Now, I don't know about you, but I think sometimes some of us might look at our life and we say, if I was an Israelite, you know what I would say? Why was I born in Egypt? Why was I born a Hebrew? Why was I, did I get this crummy job? You know, they, I'm sure they would have rather have been born an Egyptian. I'm sure they would have rather have been born in Syria or some other part of the world. And so we experience in our life, why was I born in that family? Why was I born that nationality? Why do I have that job? And we look at those things and those in our life that we wish were different. But God can in a minute change our situation. God in a minute can change our identity to a new nation. We can look back like that hyssop that was bitter. And we can have bitterness for why we went through this and our past life and why I was in bondage and why I was this. We can be bitter about the things that happened to us in our life and our past. Or we can look forward in faith to the newness of God and newness of life in Christ. The old is passed away. He said, behold, I make all things new. I'm not going to live in the regrets of the past. doesn't matter if I did it or somebody else did it to me. I'm not going to live in that. It's a new day. It's a new hour. I'm going into the promised land. God's giving me a new identity. And so the power of the cross is this, that you identify with the cross, that you identify. The Bible said your old man was crucified on the cross with Christ. So when the enemy comes to me and he wants to tell me you're this or you're that or you, you're a sinner or a temptation, I say, devil, you're a liar. I died on the cross with Jesus. My old man, my old nature, my old sinful way died on the cross with Jesus. He was buried, my old man, my carnal nature, that, that old way of living and thinking was buried in the ground with Jesus. When he came up out of the grave in resurrection power, I walk in newness of life. I am a new creature in Christ. I am a new man. All the things I used to be, I used to do, they died on the cross with Jesus. I'm not that person anymore. When the devil tries to come to you and tempt you and get you to do something that uh, you're not supposed to do and live a sinful life and comes to entice you, you say, I am dead to that. I'm dead to the world. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to temptation because I'm a new man and I'm living in Christ now. So we count ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And so the cross is powerful because the big word that we want to use with it is um, appropriation. We appropriate the blood of Jesus in our life to overcome the bondage and sin that Satan used to have us in and wants us to go back to. I appropriate the grace of God because I identify with Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. So I die daily. The Apostle Paul said, I die. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm a new creation. I'm a new creature. I have a new nature. I don't live in the, under Pharaoh's bondage, bondage to sin, 
bondage to slavery, bondage to that mentality. I'm not going to feel sorry for myself because I was born this way or in this family or that. I'm going to look forward because I have a new identity in Christ. It's so powerful, identification with the cross and appropriating the grace of God to live in victory from every stronghold. The Bible says on the cross, Jesus defeated the strongholds. He took our sin. So he dealt with Satan, he dealt with sin, and he dealt with self, with self, with me, with what I want. It's dealt with so I can walk in victory. I can walk in power. I can be an overcomer because of the cross. You see how powerful it is? The cross, it's available. All I have to do is walk, put that belt on and live in that truth. All I have to do is believe that and put that belt on, and I can be set free from anything. I can be set free from everything. It's powerful, the cross, the blood. It's powerful. Satan was defeated. Sin was defeated. Self was defeated. And Jesus is the victor. And so he went through that in uh, verse 12. The death angel went through, and they all died, and they went out. And in verse 14, the Lord said, this day is going to be a memorial for you. And it's going, you're going to keep this feast throughout your generations as a statute forever. You'll keep it a feast. And he goes on, and he says, okay, every single year I want you to commemorate this day. Every single year I, don't, I want you to do a Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread I want you to commemorate because this is a powerful day. Why do we celebrate Easter every year? Why do we celebrate Christmas every year? Because we commemorate, we remember, we look back, especially Easter. You know, it is the cross. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. If we take out the cross, there is no Christianity. You take out the cross, there is no power. And so we do these things every year, and it, he goes down to say, and, and your children. So when your children ask you, why do we have a purple cloth on the cross? Why do we have Easter lilies at the altar on Easter? Why do we wave palm branches on Palm Sunday? That you can tell your children that God loved the world and sent his son Jesus. Jesus came into the city on the Passover feast. That's why he was there. He was a good Jew. He was commemorating the Passover, and he became the Passover lamb on the cross. He drank the bitter cup of herbs of that hyssop, the bitterness of life. If you are in bitterness of life today, Jesus drank that cup for you. Jesus took that bitter cup. He tasted death for every man that you can be set free from the bitterness of your past. It was powerful. So we tell these stories, and our kids, we might know it like the back of our hand, but what about your little ones? Do they know what the cross is about? Do they know what Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is? We want them to know it. We want them to live it. We want them to believe it. We want them to walk in it. So we're going to celebrate Easter. We're going to celebrate this time of year, and we are going to put behind us Leaven. We're going to purge our life from those things by the power of the blood of Jesus' cross. Okay, so we have freedom, right? I think we cover most of this. I just have one thing to um, say as we, you know, are preparing again for Easter. And that is that David, one of the greatest men in the Bible, David loved God with all his heart. It says, and he wrote in Psalm 51 after he failed. He failed the Lord. And he said in Psalm 51, 7 and 8, purge me. See, that's that purging of leaven. That's that putting away. Purge me with hyssop. That's those bitter herbs that I might be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, God, and renew a right spirit. And so he said, purge me and wash me. He said, God, pull the plug on sin and let it drain out of my life and then clean out the bowl. 
You know, the Bible says in Isaiah, though our sins were as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. He said, I'm going to remove the stain from your life. I'm going to remove the sin from your life. They are like scarlet, but you're going to be as white as snow. It's so powerful, you know, uh, repenting and purging and salvation and the cross and the blood. It is so powerful if we appropriate it, if we believe it and we appropriate it, we can walk in newness of life the new creation, man and woman. So when we come in on Easter, we can wear uh, a, a new outfit, and that's a white robe of righteousness because of Christ. We can put on a garment of praise because we're so thankful and full of praise for what he has done for us. So we're going to walk in this newness of life. They went out that day from Egypt and they were new, and they were free. They were free. They were free. No more chains, no more shackles. They are free. We sing that song. When we accept Christ as our Savior, the chains drop off. We are free. We are not under the servitude of sin and Satan any longer. We are free, new creatures in Christ, a new name, a new people identified with Jesus. And so we want to just live in uh, this live in this newness of life and in the power and the blood. And as we've accepted Christ as our life, the power to transform our life, that we remember I'm not that old person. I'm not that old man. I'm not that old woman. I'm a new person. I'm a new creature. I'm living a new life. I'm walking in the spirit. I'm not walking in the flesh anymore. There's power to overcome sin. And so the blood of Jesus, and you stand to your feet with me right now. If you'll stand to your feet with me. And I want you to, there's two passages that you will uh, go home and read. is Romans 6, the whole chapter where it talks about the old man and the being crucified. And it talks about us walking in newness of life. Um, but the other thing I want you to think about, and I want us to think about, this season. It's a good time. When I grew up in a church, we thought very long and hard during the Lent season, that six weeks, and we checked our heart regularly to see if we were purging out sin from our life. We checked our heart regularly to see if I was eating everything on the plate. We examined ourselves, and we made ourselves right with God by receiving his forgiveness and his blood. But I just want to tell you, because this message was the lamb, the cross, and the blood, that, that the blood of Jesus here today, this is quick. I, I looked up a lot of scriptures. We don't have time to read them. But this is what the blood of Jesus, the shed blood on Calvary, this is what it does. It heals you. It redeems you. You were far away. Now it brings you near. It brought peace with God. The blood of Jesus brought you and God into peace. It gave you forgiveness of sins. As far as the east is from the west, he separated our sins from us. It cleanses our conscience so you don't have to walk around with a guilty conscience because of the blood of Jesus in your mind. It remits your sins. That means it takes them far from you. It gives us boldness into the throne of God, into the presence of God. I come boldly because sin isn't my problem anymore. The blood of Jesus took care of it. I can come boldly to my heavenly father and ask him for help in a time of need. It sanctifies us. That means it makes us holy. It redeems us because he purchased us with this blood. And it cleanses us from all sin. Bible in Revelation 12, 11 says they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We're overcoming Satan. We overcame him with our identification in the cross. We're overcoming him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Our testimony is Jesus loves me and died for me. My testimony is that's what I used to be. But now, this is what I am now. 
I want us to celebrate. I want us to celebrate this season. I want us to understand the importance of the cross and Passover, the lamb, the blood, and the cross. I want it to be at the forefront. The cross is the center of Christianity. I want us to meditate on it. I want us to think about it. I want us to appropriate it. I want us to walk in it because it'll give you power. It'll make you lift your head high. It'll give you confidence in life because that's what you used to be but this is who you are now. That's what I was, but this is who I am today because of Christ. Amen. Bow your head. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you said, Behold, I make all things new. Lord, today, old things are passed away. Everybody in this room that has something old, they're hanging on to a memory a situation that happened to him, Lord, bitter experiences in life, we're letting go today in Jesus' name. We're turning our back on it, and we're facing the cross, and we see our redemption, we see our Savior, we see the Lamb of God who takes away sin from the world. We accept him, we believe it, we'll walk in the power of that cross and Jesus, today, we just ask you that we would become more and more like you. More and more like you as we put on the, old, the new man. We put on the new man. We love you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to let Brandis, if you'll, oh, will you just close with something, anything? <laughs> Let's just turn our hearts to the Lord, and she's going to lead us in something. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my you will be praised, you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord you will be you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be you will be praised with angels and saints. We sing worthy are you, Lord. And that's why we sing your praise will ever be on our lips, ever be on our lips. Your praise will ever be on our lips ever be on our lips your praise will ever be on our lips ever be on our lips your praise will ever be on our lips ever be on our lips amen amen right you may be dismissed <laughs> god bless you